Hello, and welcome to Lecture 9 of Semantics. So, in this, le in the, in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to add, talk about how to add data structures to L2. And in so doing, we'll move from L2 to L3, because we're moving ever closer to a, uh, a full-fledged programming language that you could actually use for substantial programs. So, the first, for so, there's the data sort of comes in two varieties. You can group things together and you can uh, you can consider alternatives. And so um, so for instance, you can use a boolean to make a choice. So you have true and false and you can branch to the left or the right branch. And you we also have uh, records and classes and things like this in programming languages which lets us group data together. And so for L3, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, start by considering how to group data together. So we're going to start with product types um, or pair types. And so the product type uh, T1 times T2 uh, represents a pair of values, one of type T1 and one of type T2. And so the introduction forms uh, for this uh, for this uh, product type is a pair. So we have one expression e1 and paired with a second expression e2. And so the idea is that whatever value e1 evaluates to will be the first component of the of the pair, and whatever e2 evaluates to will be the second component of the pair. And once you have a pair, you'll will be able to project out the first and the second components of the pair. So writing sharp 1e will get us the first component, and writing sharp 2e will get us the second component. Um, in OCaml, you, we might write first of e and second of e for these two operations. And so the so the typing rules for products are pretty much what you would expect. So we would have if e1 has the type t1 in the context gamma, and e2 has the type t2 in the context gamma, then the pair e1 comma e2 will have the product type t1 times t2 again in the context gamma. So note that there's no binding binding that occurs in this uh, in the in the rules for products. It's always the same gamma because no no expression actually gets bound. And so if we have an E, which has the type T1 times T2, when we project the first component, what type is it going to be? Of course, it's going to be T1, which is the type of the first component of the pair. And similarly, if we have an expression E of type T1 times T2, when we project out the second component, we get T2. So this T2 corresponds to the second component of the, of the pair. And the way that we model this in the programming language is first we extend our set of values to say that a pair value is a pair of values, v1 comma v2. And then when we see an expression, e1 comma e2, the way that we evaluate it goes from left to right. So when you see a pair e1 comma e2, the first thing that you do is you evaluate e1. And so if e1 can step to e1 prime, then the pair e1 comma e2 will step to e1 prime comma e2. So the uh, e2 stays the same and the e1 takes a step. And when the first component is a value, so if we have v1 comma e2, so this is a pair where the first pair expression, where the first component is already a value, then what we can do is we can evaluate the second component. So if e2 takes a step to e2 prime, then uh, v1 e2 will go to v1 e2 prime. And so you can see that the pair one and pair two rules are mutually exclusive because values don't actually uh, evaluate. And so as a result, we will always apply the pair one rules, a rule until we reach a, 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 a pair expression with v1 as a, with, the, with its first component of value, and then after that we'll evaluate the second component. And so these two rules enforce the left to right ev uh, evaluation of pair expressions. And so this will uh, so these rules end up looking a lot like the rules for function applications. All right, and if we actually have a uh, um, 
a pair of a pair value v1 comma v2 then when we project out the first component what we do is we throw away the second component and return only the first bit so v1 comma v2 so sharp 1 of v1 comma v2 is going to go to v1 and when we do sharp 2 of v1 comma v2 we'll get v2 so there's no effect on the store all we do is we project out the appropriate component of the pair um, and again, we're going to need congruence rules as well because when when we see an expression sharp one of e, it might not it might not be a pair value straight away. So what we'll do is we'll say that if e steps to e prime, then sharp one e will step to sharp one e prime, and similarly for uh, for uh, for sharp two. And so what this will do is it'll evaluate the expression e until it reaches the uh, until it reaches a value and then we can project out either the first or the second component um, and so let's actually take a little look at this uh, so um, OCaml has pairs so we can we can have pairs like three comma string and you can see that the type the type of this expression here will become int times string and the int corresponds to the three and the string corresponds to the second component and one thing to notice here is that when we write t1 times t2 we don't actually require t1 and t and t2 to be the same type instead we say they can be different types so this is more like a record than like an array and obviously there's no uh, there's no restriction to just uh, strings and things like this so for instance we can have like true and um, like I don't know some five and now we would have a pair of a boolean and a int option and if we want to project out a a component we can use the first and second operations so first we'll will give us the first component of the pair and second will project out the second component of the pair giving us a uh, giving us the string so next what we can do is we can look at tagged unions and uh, what is a tagged union and the answer is it's a bit like an ml data type it's a it's or or classes in java so what it is is we'll write t1 plus t2 and this represents uh, a value which could either be a t1 or a t2 and we can tell them apart with a tag so we can tag an expression e as either belonging to the left half of the t1 of the of the sum type or we can tag it with a right in right saying that it belongs to the right branch of the uh, of the uh, sum type and once you have once you have one of these uh, values the way that you use a value of some type is with a kind of pattern matching expression so if you have something of some type then in order to do something with it you have to get access to either the t1 or the t2 and Unlike with some types, we can't just project things out because we don't know which branch it's in. And so what we can do is we can do a kind of pattern matching where we say, let's do a case analysis. And if the tag was in left, then we'll bind the variable x1 of type t1 and evaluate e1. So if you have something of type, uh, say, in left of 5, then this variable x1 will get bound to the 5. And similarly, for the if you have something of say in of type in right, oh sorry, of sort in of class in right, then you bind the contents of that tagged value to x2, and then you evaluate e2. So the idea is that we we're sort of smooshing together uh, data into two alternatives, and you, now you can branch on it. So if you've programmed in Java, you've probably had like an abstract class with several concrete classes as a subclass of it. And so that defines a kind of a tagged union as well. So both of the both of the subclasses have the same common interface or abstract type. And when you receive one of these values, you have to uh, you have to so you have to branch to uh, figure out 
what to do with this data, like either by dynamic, dis dynamic dispatch with methods or by doing an instance of test. Okay, so the way that we type check sums is we say, if you have an expression of type T1, then in left of E, we'll have the type T1 plus T2. And if you have the uh, an E of type T2, then in right of E, we'll have the type T1 plus T2. And if you have something of type T1 plus T2, then when you do the when you type check this case expression, what you do is you need to check each branch. And so for the left branch, you say, okay, I'm going to bind the contents of this tagged union to the variable x. And because the in left branch is going to correspond to the case where you have a uh, an in left, the the contents are going to be the contents are going to be T, uh, a T1. And similarly for the in right branch, the contents of the tagged union are going to be a T2. And so the sort, the types of these two variables are a bit different. One is a T1 and one is, is a T2. And at runtime, we'll decide which branch to take by matching on the tag. And one, th one thing you might have noticed is that these, uh, these expressions all have type annotations. So our case expression has a type annotation and our uh, our in left and in right have annotations. And by putting in these annotations, we're able to maintain uniqueness of typing. Otherwise, it's unclear what a, an expression, what type an expression like in left of three might have. It might be an int plus int, or it might be an int plus bool, because we can't see in the source code what the what the other type might need to be. And so you might wonder what happens in ML with this sort of thing. And the answer is that in ML, well, let me make this a little bit bigger again. So what happens in ML is we can, do, let's first define a, a type for some types, is that ML has polymorphism. And what, what happens in ML is that when you don't know the, uh, the type of a branch, you can, you can uh, use polymorphism to say, well, the other side could be anything. So if we introduce a sum type, then we can create a value and this might be an int bool sum. Uh, let's see. Okay, and so let's do let v of type is equal to. And so it's perfectly happy to give it give it a type of int bool int plus bool when we give it an int left plus three. And in this case, I put in a type annotation just like in the on the slides. But what would happen if we left that off? So if we just did let v prime equals in left of three. And so what you can see here is that ML used polymorphism to uh, to deal with the ambiguity about the right branch. It said, well, I can look at this in left of three and I can see that the left branch is definitely an integer. And I don't know what the right branch could be, so I'm going to make it polymorphic. It could be anything. And so now we can use uh, this v prime in any in in any uh, in any context where we express a, expect a sum type where the left branch is an integer. Okay. And so the reduction rules for sums are pretty straightforward. So. For when we when we add, when we add values to the, extend the grammar of values, what we're going to do is we're going to say a value of some type is a tagged value. So it's either going to be in left of v or in right of v. And the only reduction rule for in left is we want to evaluate this expression until it becomes a value. So we're only going to have a congruence rule that says e, if e steps to e prime, then in left of e steps to in left of e prime, and then what we're going to do is we're going to offer a one congruence rule for the case statement, which says when you do a case analysis, you want to case analyze a value. So when you see case E of something, in left X goes to E1, in right Y goes to E2, what we do is we evaluate E 
until it becomes a value. So if e steps to e prime, then kc will go to kc prime. And then finally, when that e has become a value, we'll either have a case in left of v or case in right of v. And if it's an in left of v, then we're going to take the left branch. And the way that we take the left branch is by substituting v for x and then, ev uh, and then evaluating e1. So this ex whole expression will evaluate to v for x e1. And we just throw away the branch that was not taken. And similarly, if this were an in right, then what we would do is we would substitute v for y and evaluate e2. Okay, and so the, what you can see so far is that we've had this pattern where for each type we have a constructor or introduction form for it, which is how we make values of that type. So for functions, we, we have um, an anonymous function construct, fn x goes to something. For, for pairs, for products, we have a pair as the formation or constructor rule for it. And for some types, we have a, uh, an in a tagged expression, so in left of e or in right of e. And when you want to eliminate or destroy or use a value, what, uh, what, you, what we have are what are called destructors or eliminators. And so if you have a function, you use it by giving it an argument. And when you have a tuple, what you do is you use it by projecting out one of the components. So we have sharp one and sharp two as the destructors for pairs. And for some types, we our destructor is a case statement or pattern matching. And even Booleans fit this pattern. So for a Boolean, we have two constructors, true and false, and the destructor for it is an if then else. And the interesting thing about this constructor-destructor pattern is that it actually matches lot, uh, the, the rules of propositional logic. So each of the constructions of a simply typed functional program correspond to the rules of propositional logic. So when you refer to a variable in your context, so you, we say x has the type t, by looking it up in the context and say, okay, if, if x colon t occurs in the context, the, pro, the variable occurrence x has the type t. And we can say this corresponds to proving p from having assumed it. So if you assume p, then you can use that assumption to conclude p. And if you want to prove that p implies p prime, well, what do you do? You assume p and then you show that p prime holds. And how do you show that a lambda abstraction, fn x goes to e, has the type t arrow t prime? Well, you assume that the uh, variable has the type t, and you show that the body has the type t prime. And how do you use how do you use an implication? Well, if you know that p implies p prime, and you also know that p holds, then you can conclude that p prime holds. And so if you look at function application, well, if you know that t goes to t prime is a function from t to t prime, and e2 has the type t, then the application e1, e2 has the type t prime. Okay, that's really quite interesting. And this actually extends, all this correspondence uh, actually extends to all of the uh, type formers. So for pairs, we can form pairs by saying if you have a, something of type t1 and something of type t2, you can uh, form a pair t1 times t2. And when we want to prove a conjunction p1 and p2, what we do is we say if you can prove p1 and you can prove p2, then you can prove p1 and p2. And if you know that p1 and p2 holds, you can conclude p1 holds. And if you know that p1 and p2 holds, you are also allowed to conclude that p2 holds. And these correspond precisely to the rules for uh, projecting from a pair. So if you have a pair t1 times t2, you can, uh, by projecting the first component, you, get the, you can get an expression of type t1. And similarly, for if you have a pair t1 times t2, if you project the second component, you get something of type, type t2. 
And so you can see that these projection rules correspond to the elimination rules for conjunction in logic. Like these are the way that you use conjunction, you were taught to use conjunction in discrete mathematics. And even for disjunction or or, it works the same way. If you have, you can show that P1 or P2 holds by showing that P1 holds. And you can show that something has the tagged union type T1 plus T2 by tagging a value of type T1. And so this carries through through each of the um, constructions of, L, of L3 now. Um, so functions, sum types, product types, um, it carries through all the way. So every functional programming language construct has a corresponding uh, uh, rule of propositional logic. Um, the only things that don't have a direct logical correspondence are recursion and st and state. Um, the, the way that those two things have uh, a logical interpretation is significantly more complicated. It still exists, but it's more complicated. And you can learn about that in the Type Systems course next year. And so one thing that this correspondence has driven um, is that it's driven quite a lot of research in programming language design over the last uh, 25, 30 years. Like, I think it was discovered in the late 60s, early 70s, um, and it's sort of slowly gathered momentum as time has gone on, as more and more features of programming languages turn out to have, like, some sort of logical interpretation. Um, so ideas from modal logic, like temporal logic and things like this, correspond to reactive programming languages. Um, it's a it's a it's a really productive uh, it's a really productive analogy to go from a uh, a logical reading to a programming language and vice versa, because when you see a correspondence like this, it like immediately gives you the idea. Well, what happens to all the things in programming languages that don't have an obvious logical correspondence? Is there some idea in logic that we had overlooked until now? And so there's a there's been a really productive. Uh, productive interplay between uh, logic and computation. Okay, so so these sums and products um, are kind of the kernel or essence of the ML data type mechanism. So like data types in ML you can sort of see as a generalization of both uh, sums and products. And so if you see a declaration like, you know, int list is either null of unit or cons of int times int list, this is sort of like saying that an int list is a unit plus an int times an int list. Um, and I say roughly because this definition is circular. So we define int list in terms of int list. And so you have to do a bit of work to show that these kinds of circular or recursive definitions are justified. Um, and that's work we're not going to do in this course. But you've already seen that I defined some types here. Where did I do that? So I defined some types as a uh, as an ML data type. So ML doesn't have, it has uh, pairs built in, but it, for some reason it doesn't have some types built in. But because we have the data type mechanism in, in ML, we can just encode it with a, by defining a data type of our own and using it as the sum type. Um, and similarly, or Similarly, uh, just as uh, ML data types, you can sort of see as an extended sum type. Um, you can also see record types as a kind of generalization of product types. So imagine that we have a set of labels. Then what we can do is we can define a new, t a new type of records as label one T1 to label K TK. And so, uh, so what we can say is we have a record where the field label one has the type T1 and the field label K has the type TK. And then what we can do is we can form records by, you know, by uh, saying, okay, label one is in this record value, 
label 1 gets the expression E1, the label K gets the expression EK, and if you have a label, you can project out a component from it. And so this is a generalization of records in the sense that you can have more than two components, and also you can name the fields. You don't have to use like sharp 1, sharp 2, sharp 3. You can name the fields that you, produ that you project. And so the typing rules for, for records are going to be something like, okay, a, label, a record expression will have a record type if each of the components has the appropriate type. So if label 1 is equal to E1 in the, in the expression and the type tells you that label 1 should have the type T1, well then you check that E1 has the type T1 and that all the way up to EK having the type TK. Um, and you can see like a, a little bit of abusive notation here. I write dot 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 and um, that's okay because you're a human being and you can read this rule and you know what I mean. You know that the each E sub i has to correspond to the T sub i. And when you uh, um, formulate this very precisely you have to you have to be a bit more careful. Um, but like Typically, you only need to be that careful when you're trying to convince a, a computer that your proof is correct. Um, and once you have an expression of record type, what you can do is you can project out a component from it. So if you want to con uh, project out the component label from the ex record expression E, you'll get something of the appropriate type. And the evaluation rules for records are the same as for pairs. It's the same left to right evaluation. It's just that like stating the rules is a little bit more annoying. So values are, um, are record expressions where all the components are values. And what you want to do is you want to say, well, if labels 1 through i minus 1 are all values, then you can evaluate the ith expression. And you evaluate the first one first, the second one second, the third one uh, third, and then finally, when every label expression is a value, you can project out the appropriate component. And likewise, when you're uh, when you're when you have a projection expression, you evaluate the expression until it becomes a value, and only then will you be able to do the projection. Um, and again, this is a thing that uh, that exists in M in ML. Um, so what we can do is let's have say a, a record. So let's say a student, and we're going to have some fields like say uh, for name. We'll make it a string. We'll make a surname, uh, and we'll say okay, this should also be a string. And we'll let's say that uh, we'll want a CRS ID as well. And let's let's make this a string as well. And just for fun, let's put in an age, and we'll say that has to be an integer. Okay. So now, um, and so all I'm doing here is this is a record type, and I'm naming the record type so that I can write student rather than writing this whole large record expression. And so. Um, Let's uh, let's uh, pick something. Um, normally, I would call on someone in the lecture theater, but since we don't have that, uh, um, I'll pretend I am a student once more and put in my own name. So, and let's say CRS ID NK four eighty. So now you know how to email me, and my age is uh, forty four. And so this is a value of type string. And uh, where to go? And so we said, okay, this is of student type, so this is the abbreviation, and we have the we have all of these components. Um, and so if we let's uh, let's bind it to a variable, and so now x has the type student, and it's equal to this uh, record value. And if we wanted to take out the for name, we can project out components as we like, and you can see that they all have the uh, the expected uh, with the expected the expected components. Okay, so now um, most languages will have like some form of mutable store in the programming language, and so there's sort of two main styles of adding store. Um, 
so uh, of adding mutable data to your programming language. So one thing that we could do is what we already have in L1 and L2. So in L1 and L2, what we've got are like literal locations, which are which store mutable values, and the variables are all immutable. They refer to a previously calculated value. And so now, and then what we do is we have explicit dereferencing and assignment operators for the locations. So you can write in a function expression like fnx goes to L, uh, store contents of L plus x into L. The other alternative, which you might, which you're probably more familiar with, is the choice made in C in Java. And so, what a variable in a language like that does is it lets you refer to a pre previously calculated ver uh, value, and it lets you overwrite that value with another one. So, if you have a variable L, um, you're allowed to just use the variable name to get the get the value and then you're allowed to update it using an assignment and then there's like some type machinery like const declarations that let you limit the amount of mutability um and so this there's there's trade-offs either way um so so the the big advantage of uh of having only immutable bindings is that it's a little bit easier to reason about. Um, like the there's the substitution rule is always valid for uh, um, for dealing with variables. If you see a variable, you're allowed to substitute a value with it, and it's all fine. Um, however, with mutable variables, this is no substitution is no longer true. Because if you have an assignment like L gets set to L plus X, and you know up here that say L is three, you're no longer allowed to substitute three for L. Because you'll see, you'll get, you, when you do the substitution, you'll get an odd expression, like three is equal to three plus X. And that, do that doesn't make any sense. And so the, the semantics of variables in a C or Java-like language um, you have to maintain as an explicit map in the semantics. And when you see a variable a reference, you do a dereference uh, right at that point. And when you, do, when you do the assignment, you have the, the variable name available to do the store into. Um, and the, uh, the, the uh, having, having a, a binding only view of mutable data structures is like sort of beneficial for reasoning and analysis. I think I mentioned in an early, earlier language that most compilers compile to what is called SSA form, which is basically a, a, an internal representation where all values, uh, all variables are immutable. And this makes program analysis and compiler optimizations a bit easier to write. Um, on the other hand, um, having mutable variables is convenient for humans, especially if you're writing an imperative uh, uh, algorithm. So if you if you have an algorithm with uh, with loops in it, having mutable variables um, makes uh, makes a lot of the machinery of your loops a bit easier to read. So it's just it's just nicer to read is l great while l is greater than zero than while bang l is greater than zero. So there's a bit less noise. Um, like overall my personal judgment is that immutable bindings are a little bit easier to use um, but that perspective is like slightly distorted by the fact that I do a lot of uh, program verification and there you want to minimize as much friction as you can in the reasoning um, and if you're not if you're not doing very much uh, program uh, uh, program verification, then the reduced noise of implicit dereferencing might win. It sort of depends on what you want to use the language for. Okay, <clears throat> so I talked a little bit about references, and now what we can do is, so far in L2, what has happened is that uh, we have these bare locations, um, L, which are only allowed to store integers. And now what we can do is we can move to a more ML-like view of the world where 
we don't have like a fixed set of locations like registers. Instead, what we have are dynamically allocatable references. So you can dynamically allocate a reference, pass it around as a value, and you can store uh, values of arbitrary type into the reference. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add a new type, t ref, which you can think of as this is a reference or pointer to a t. And we're going to remove from our language, the, the types of locations are no longer just going to be int ref, they're going to be, um, you know, a map saying each location has a, a reference type. So it's a reference of this, uh, of the storing uh, value of this type t. And so every location can potentially store a value of a different type. And so what we'll do is we'll, we're going to remove the assignment and update operators and re replace them with, uh, with a new grammar. So what we're going to do is we're going to say our values are going to be bare locations as before, but now we have an expression ref e, which will let us allocate a new, uh, a new re reference. And once you have a reference, you can dereference it. You can write bang e rather than just bang l because references are now values that can be passed around in, as arguments to functions and stored in data structures. And now bang e says when you get a hold of a reference, you're allowed to dereference it. And similarly, we no longer write l gets uh, uh, l, l uh, store e2 into l because references are expressions and values. They're a fully first class notion and so you can compute a location that you want to store e2 into. And so we can say e1, assign e2 to e1. And now the typing for these constructions will say, all right, if e has the type t, then the expression ref e will have the type t ref. And the way that assignment will work, it will say is, okay, E1 assigned to E2, um, it will work when the value that you're, the expression that you're storing, E2 has the type T, and the location you're storing it into, E1, has the type T ref. And so this means that the uh, new value that you're putting into the reference will have the right type. And that means that it's always the case that when you dereference something of type uh, T ref, you get out something of type T. So you're allowed to store anything you like into the reference from any point in your program, as long as it's of the right, of the right type. And that means that whenever you dereference something anywhere in your program, then you know, the dereference will also have the right type. And finally, we're going to extend our store mapping to, uh, to have a map from locations to the reference type. So our gamma, recall, is a pair. One is a map from locations to location types, and the other is a map from variables to the types of each variable. And so what we do when we see a location value is we're going to say, well, look it up in the context. Is this location have the type T ref? Then the value L will have the type T ref. Okay, and so this is the whole typing for, uh, for references. And a location is now a value. It's, uh, it's not like a, a register expression in our source code. Uh, uh, um, locations are just full first class values now. And so now what we're going to do is we also need to change the store. So the store S used to be a finite partial map from uh, L to integers. And now we want to take it a finite partial map from the set of locations to the set of all values. And so now what we'll do is we'll say we're going to add two rules for uh, the ref expression. So if we write ref v, then what we're going to do is we're going to say that we're going to choose some location L, which is not already in the domain of S. Um, and because it's a finite partial map, we're always able to find one. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll say that the, this, this chosen location will now store the value v and the value of the reference expression is going to be the location l. And so 
before we can store the value into the uh, into the store, we have to evaluate the ref e expression until it becomes a value. So if e steps to e prime, then ref e will go step to ref e prime, and then this will this expression will trundle along until we reach a ref v, at which point we do actually do the allocation. So this is the way you should think about it. This is like a dynamic allocation in uh, Java or C. We're doing a malloc here, and we've malloced a new pointer, and we're storing v into that pointer and then returning the pointer value. Value. And then the reduction rules for dereferencing and assignment will also sort of work the way that you expect. When you when we want to dereference something, bang e, we don't know which location to look at until we have e as a value. So we're going to evaluate e to e prime and then bang e to bang e prime. And then finally, when this uh, reference expression is a value, we'll have bang l. And at this point, we can look in the domain, in, in the store, and if L is in the domain and S of L is equal to V, then this dereference expression, bang L, is going to evaluate to V. And it'll evaluate to V because we're looking it up in the store. Likewise, for, uh, for assignments, what we want to do is we want to say, if you see E gets assigned to E2, evaluate the first component, um, so if e steps to e prime, then e assigned e2 will go to e prime assigned e2. Um, and once that's a value, we're going to evaluate the uh, location, the value to be stored as well. So l gets assigned to e will go to l gets assigned to e prime. And note that the congruence rules, as always, are structured in order to enforce a left or right evaluation. So um, the assign to rule will only work when the thing on the left is a location. And so that means that if the thing on the left is not a location, the only rule that applies is the assign three rule. So we'll evaluate this one until it becomes a value. And now once it's a value, we'll assign this one. And then when both of them are a value and you see store V into L, then what we'll do is we'll say, okay, this assignment is going to reduce to the unit value skip. And what we will do is we're going to update the store so that uh, we're going to check that the uh, location is in the store and then we're going to update s so that l now points to v because we wanted to store v into l and this gives you the type system and operational semantics for l3 which now has like sort of first class references in it and so our uh, our statement of type safety has to change as well so when we stated progress and preservation before, our, top our type properties said before that, oh yes, the domain of, the, of, the, of gamma had to be of a subset of the domain of S. And that expressed that every location mentioned in gamma occurs in the actual runtime store S. And so now, because the value at each location can be different, we need to uh, have a stronger condition. We need to say that for each location in the domain of S, we need that S of L is typable under whatever gamma of L says. And moreover, as the program evaluates, what will happen is that the domain of the store will change. So if you look at this reference, um, the domain is going to grow when we when we do the when we do the allocation and so we also have to take into account the fact that the domain of the store can grow as the program evaluates so if you if you look at this little expression here so we have a function pointer here we're going to store the identity fun uh, function at integers into this reference x and then we're going to update x to um, to be the function which is uh, um, going to it's we're going to we're, we're, which is we're going to update x to a function expression which dereferences x so we're implementing recursion using our uh, our uh, our our pointers to functions then um, we, we 
then we can apply the contents of that function to three. And so what this is going to do is it's going to say, okay, check if z is bigger than one, otherwise return z plus the contents of x on z minus one. And when you reach zero, return zero. So this is going to sum up the numbers from, uh, uh, from what your argument down to zero. And what we're doing, and this is a trick which I should explain, is we are implementing recursion by using by using mutable store. So let's uh, let's uh, actually do this. So let's do let x is equal to ref fun x. Let's make it an int. So now x is a uh, x is a, uh, a pointer to a function, and now we can define a function f, which is going to be uh, fun, uh, fun z goes to if z is greater than or equal to zero, or greater than zero, then what we want to do is we want to return z plus the contents of x at z minus one, otherwise a zero. And so this is going to be a function from int arrow int. And so what we'll do is we'll get our argument f, z, uh, z, we'll check if the argument is bigger than one, and if it's bigger than one, what we're going to do is we're going to add z to the contents of x run on z minus one. And so now what we can do is we can do something like, uh, let's say, um, f of zero is going to return zero, f of one will return one, because we're going to call one plus bang x of z minus one, and if we pass, say, five, what's going to happen is we'll get nine, because we add five to bang x on four. And since the contents of x are the identity function, we, this will return four. So this expression will be five plus four, or nine. And now, if we wanted to implement a fully recursive function, what we can do is we can set x to f. And so now we have a loop. So x contains f itself. And so now when you call f, what will happen is when you dereference x, you'll get f back. And so we've implemented recursion. So now let's call bang x on 5 and you get 15. And if you call bang x on 3, you get 6. And you can see that this is giving the sums of the numbers from the argument down to 0. So, it's good. so you can see 6, 10, 15, 21, 28. And that's exactly the series that you expect. Um, OK. So we've implemented this recursive function, and the sequence of reductions that we get is we're going to have a start in an empty store, and then we're going to store the locate the identity function, and then we're going to store this uh, this lambda abstraction in which L1 contains a value which refers to L1, and then after some additional re reductions, this is going to give us six because that's three plus two plus one plus zero. Okay. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to introduce a little bit of notation. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say that uh, um, gamma satisfies S if for every location in the domain of S there exists a T such that gamma of L is equal to T, uh, T ref, I mean, and the value stored in S at the location L has the type T. And so what this is saying is that all the types uh, of locations mentioned in gamma are compatible with the actual values that occur inside of S. So for each location L in S, we check that S of L has the type T, where gamma of L ha is equal to T. So we could write this as gamma turnstile S of L um, colon T, uh, gamma of L. Uh, and the only reason we, we, we don't write it that way is we want to ensure that the, this gamma is actually defined because it's a partial function. Okay, so now what we can, what, now with this do definition saying that every location in S is 
the contents of every location in S is well typed according to the store typing in gamma, the statement of type preservation will be that if E is closed and E is well typed in gamma, and gamma tells you that S is well typed, and ES transitions to E prime S prime, then there's going to be some gamma prime um, with disjoint domain to gamma, so that means there's some additional locations allocated where E prime is has the type T in this extended context, gamma, gamma prime, and S prime is well typed in this extended context, gamma, gamma prime. So we're growing from gamma to gamma, comma, gamma prime, and E prime will still have the type T and the new store will still have the type, will still be well typed in the extended store. So if you look up here, the store typing would be empty and the store itself is empty. And so now progress will tell us here that gamma will say, well, L1 has to be, have the type ref into int ref. And so, and we'll also check that the function here has the type into int. And so now with this notation, we can extend all of the, with this definition of what a well-typed store is, we're able to extend each of the statements for progress and preservation. So now we can say for progress that if you have a closed well-typed expression and a well-typed store with respect to gamma, then either you use a value or it can make progress. And similarly, and once you have progress, we can prove preservation. And so notice here that the uh, domain of, of, uh, of gamma being a subset of the domain of S has changed into the, this definition of a well-typed store. And what I want to emphasize is that this is only a modest generalization. So before, what we wrote was that the domain of gamma had to be a subset of This will be a bit bigger again. Before, what we said was that the domain of gamma had to be a subset of the domain of the store S. And if you recall your discrete mathematics, what this means is that for every location L, if L is in the domain of gamma, then L is in the domain of S. And so this is just the definition of subsets. And so now what we can do is we can extend this, uh, uh, this uh, definition. So we defined our well-typed store as, uh, as gamma v dash s. We took it to mean that for all locations in the domain of S, what we want is for, uh, oh yes, so we said we want uh, the domain, we, we took this to mean that the domain of gamma is equal to the domain of S and we said that for all L in the domain of gamma, or domain of S, say, what we did was we said that uh, if gamma of L is equal to T, then uh, gamma V dash S of L has the type T. Okay, and so what I wanna convince you is that this thing on line three and this thing on line nine are actually quite similar. And so now let's rewrite this a little bit. So I'm going to say for all L, if L is in the domain of S, then there exists a T such that this holds. And now what I want to do 
is I want to note that on line seven, we're saying the domain of S is equal to the domain of gamma. And so this condition that ga the gamma of L will be well-defined, it will always hold. So we can write this as And so we also have this condition right here that domain of gamma is equal to the domain of S. And so we can turn this around and now S and, and so now what you can see here is that this, uh, that this uh, line 13 is actually equivalent to the thing on line nine because we've assumed that the domain of gamma and the domain of S are the same. And so now, uh, this condition on line three, well, if L is in the domain of gamma, then L is in the domain of S. Um, that holds automatically. And additionally, we're saying that uh, um, the value stored at location L in S has the type stored in, the, in gamma at that location. And so this is, you can sort of see here how the store well typed store condition is a is a a generalization or as a is a refinement or something a bit stricter than what we had before and now that we have this we can state progress and type preservation and this lets us uh, this lets us say that okay if you have a closed well typed expression with a well typed store um, then then uh, either it's a value or it can take a, it can make progress um, in in uh, like it'll it'll never get it'll never get stuck. So in no matter how many steps it takes, it's always going to either be a value or it can it can evaluate further. So we'll never we'll never uh, we'll never uh, uh, we'll never hit a, a stuck state. Okay, so I will so uh, so we have a. Uh, a definition of L3 uh, in the full definition of L3 in the notes, and there's a uh, there is an implementation of L of uh, L3, um, and it turns out that the way that we've defined L3 in these uh, in these uh, slides is that it's a subset of uh, standard ML, and so you can run a standard ML interpreter like Moscow ML or standard ML of New Jersey, and then you can use it to run programs. Okay, and so um, I will carry on in the next lecture with more about uh, how you can formulate reduction semantics for languages, and uh, we'll carry on with our uh, we'll carry on with our semantics lectures. Thank you very much.